So if any of you have anything you you know you want to ask or any part of it you want to look at, you know, feel free to chime in with all of this. Of course, um, on this particular day, um, Baba. Okay, let me read this. This is the best description of it. This is right after Baba gave this talk to the men, September 21st, 1926. And right after it, all this happened. According to the Combined di di Diary, this lecture on the su subject of renunciation was given in the early morning. Shortly thereafter, right after this lecture, which is one of the longer ones and a very interesting one, Baba proposed, and the Mandali agreed, on a seven-day walking tour in which no money would be brought along and food would be procured by begging. This does sound like the new life, doesn't it? Makes me think of it. Further, this tour was to commence without delay that very morning at 10 a.m. You know, let's go. You've got a bunch of young men, you know, and they're all game for this. Immediately before setting out, however, Baba scaled the undertaking back to a walking tour of just one day's duration. He and the Mandali tramped to the village of Walki, uh, six mi miles distant, where they begged for their lunch. And the whole big episode developed. There was a big crowd that gathered and all sorts of things happened. Thus, a Tiffin lecture on sannyas. Do you know sannyas is renunciation? A sannyasi is one who has renounced the world and is just begging for uh, living and seeking God. At least that's the theory of it all. A Tiffin lecture on sannyas led immediately to a brief real, real world foray, foray in renunciation, along lines that were followed through on fully a quarter century later during the new life. So it kind of gives you a sense of the feeling of the time. It's like, Bob is talking about renunciation, and he says, let's do it, you know? And they all say, yeah, let's do it. You know, like, anything is possible with Baba. On a moment's notice, let's take off, let's dissolve the Maribad ashram, let's take off and just beg for our food. And that was the spirit of being around Baba. I'm sure it was thrilling. and and terrifying at the same time. So he had, this is a real uh, um, a real wonderful talk on renunciation. And let me see what would be some nice little snippets from it. Yeah, one thing that Bob has said is that uh, um, he was saying, you may think that renunciation is easy. Um, but it's actually extremely difficult because the inner renunciation is so hard. Okay. He who is a coward in materialism becomes either the greatest sinner or a master in the spiritual line. Those who have been the greatest masters in their times have been called the greatest cowards in materialism. But these cowards were heroes in the spiritual world. And, uh, you know, one who comes to mind here, who Baba talks about uh, later in this Tipa lecture, is, um, is Tukaram. And do you know the story of Tukaram? In, guys? in um, Maharashtra, uh, he's a very famous figure, but um, he lived not far from Pune. And uh, in uh, a competition for histories, um, worst businessman, he would place among the top five, I think. He was terrible. He would be, uh, he would go to the market with a whole bag full of chilies that his wife had given him, hoping that he could earn a living for the family just for once. And he would just give them all away like that. It was just hopeless. And, but he, and actually, they went through such, uh, uh, poverty that I think his family starved. And I think they died, several of them. But he wound up actually becoming a perfect master. And uh, one of the greatest, greatest poet saints, Maharashtra, um, at the, during the era of Shivaji, the great warrior king, minor incarnation of the avatar. So that would be an example of this. 
that here's somebody who looked like he was just a failure and couldn't get his act together, and, and uh, you know, but actually he was a hero in the spiritual line. We used to sell the story of his life in a DVD in there, in Coastal and I got. And uh, yeah. apparently Eric loved that video and would have it played off. He did. He did. So I, oh, he showed it, um, I think about maybe four months ago he showed it. Yes, yeah. It's also on YouTube. You can get it if you want the movie. Yes. Yeah, that's a wonderful movie. Yeah, I remember Eric really, really did like that. Movie. There were a bunch of movies made in that period, late 30s, early 40s, on these high spiritual subjects. So this is, uh, let's see, satsang. Now Baba also talks a lot here in many other places about satsang. Um, sang means uh, association and sat means truth. So satsang refers to keeping the company of the embodiment of truth, that is to say, the, the perfect master, keeping the company of the perfect master as the best of all paths, the highest of all roots. Um, do people think that, that renunciation is much easier than materialism? That hating and giving up materialism comes more easily than love, liking, and attachment to it? But that is not so. Renunciation is most difficult to such an extent that only those prepared to risk and lose their very lives may dare venture upon it. To put a line in Persian, K Ish, do we have a Persian reader here? K Ish As. Can you say it again? K Ish that is, love at first seemed easy, but as time went on, innumerable difficulties arose. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? <laughs> this is from the first couplet in the Divan of Hafez. I think it's the first line of something like, Oh, Saki, pass around the, the uh, cup and give us more to drink. Love first at first seemed easy, but then difficult. <laughs> <laughs> huh? I love your I love my story. Yes. The age of the moon. <laughs> You're in the path of love you find there. But even after everything external has been renounced, desires and ambitions still has to be have to be given up. But if one does not succeed in achieving internal renunciation, External renunciation brings advantages nonetheless. Now he talks about the people who keep the company of the perfect master. You know, we may all get our chances to do this in coming lifetimes. You know, perfect masters may show up and, you know, you'll sort of be attracted to someone and the person is actually a sadhguru. And so here's Bob is talking about the sorts of people that hang around. So, but to succeed in internal renunciation, satsang, the company of and residence with the sage, offers the best expedient and remedy. Doubtless they do well who, remaining in the world, observe and protect, practice renunciation. But the case is quite different for those who renounce and then live in the company of a sage, he means here a saint or a perfect master, after renunciation. Now those who practice satsang can be divided into three types, jatna. He who gives, takes not, and stays. He who gives not, takes not, but stays. And he who gives not, takes, but stays. So do you follow that? So he who gives, takes, in other words, you offer, you serve, you give of your service and love to the Master. You don't expect anything back, and you stay. Then the second type doesn't really do anything, doesn't really offer anything, um, but doesn't expect anything either, but remains with the perfect Master. And the third category would be people who don't actually uh, offer anything or contribute anything or do any service, who expect lots of stuff to be given to them, 
but who stay anyway. So I think we probably are all acquainted with these various types. And um, the, what strikes me about this is that actually, uh, I mean, obviously this is the uh, you know, lowest of the three types, people who don't contribute anything but are, expect handouts from the perfect master and the company, but even they benefit. Just to be with a perfect master at all, whatever kind of a, you know, shithead you are, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Go to the perfect master anyway, no matter what you're like, and you'll get the benefits from it. I, maybe I should take that back. I've just never heard that word. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you spent time in the company of Baba, the word would spring to mind, looking at certain specimens. I remember Balna too saying that when he, um, you know, Balna too was, many of you met Balna too, I would say he was an exceedingly good person. He never did, never slandered or backbit or had any vices or anything like that. And he found that there are a lot of people around Baba who are like, you know, really jerks, <laughs> extremely obnoxious, you know, and um, <laughs> and uh, Baba would say, this is the sign of a perfect one, of a perfect master or the avatar. In the darbar, you know the word darbar, it's the word the court, that, and you can, uh, uh, Sadhguru's darbar, is, it's like the court system to be in this company. There are all kinds of people, from the best to the worst. They're not all good people at all. And, you know, and it's a bit shocking, you know, as you get to know who some of the people <laughs> around the perfect one are. But that's one of the signs. Whereas if you're in the ashram of a, uh, of a saint, a wali or a mahayogi, you'll get exceedingly good people who have submitted themselves to the discipline of the master, a fifth plane master, say, and they correct your vices and get you on a yoga path. So you'll get extremely good people in the darbar of a uh, Mahayogi or a Wale, whereas if you get to the perfect master, you get every type of person. So I think that uh, would be encouraging to us, Baba lovers. I think we've had all time. <laughs> said that all, all those kinds are necessary. He said, if you're, a, uh, if you're a landlord, you need that nasty person to go around and collect the rent. You need somebody who's awful, who's, who's vicious, and who's to collect the rent each time. Yeah. A nice person going around. Yeah. They're all necessary. Yeah. Baba really had it. It was a bit shocking for me to learn what some of the Mandalay were really like. It wasn't at all my idea of goody, goody, goody. <laughs> Baba gave us people who were very, very good, like Kitty Davy, who was truly a good person, truly good. Or Eric Shimani, who had a way of making everything look really wonderful. But uh, I bet you if we had met Kakabaijul and people like that, it would have been a rude awakening. Yeah. No, John sort of reminded me also in Hollywood with saying about, you know, if you like your agent, if you think of a good person, probably bad agent, if you're a good shithead, probably a good agent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you have that. I, I was reading recently that it's a hadith of Muhammad. Um, you know, there are 99 names of God conventionally in Islam, and Muhammad commenting who said that. They're actually, everyone knows it a limitable numbers of names of God, but conventionally there are 99. And Muhammad said that uh, that's because God loves odd numbers. So it makes me think when I look at some of the Baba lovers, I think, God loves odd numbers. Huh? <laughs> well, also when you think about Baba's brother's jaw, it seems, there seems to be sort of a kind of a seedy side to his blood. Yeah, you know, mm. from things like, I mean, you know, mm. but um, it seems like you would hear one way, but he was actually going about helping people in ways that 
that right. others didn't know about or wouldn't understand if they, if they did know what he was doing to help. Yeah, he was actually supporting and helping a lot of people. Yeah, mm. it. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one of these uh, talks where Baba um, says that uh, the sadgurus, he compares sadgurus to like a raging bonfire. And what is it that bonfires uh, do? They consume um, sanskaras. And that is why a sadguru, sadgurus love sinners, because they can consume their sanskaras. And he gave the example there of Hazrat Babajan, who apparently a lot of the people around Hazrat Babajan were um, opium addicts. And uh, apparently, I, I don't know much about it. Does anybody know much about this? I don't get the impression that she was uh, had an anti-drug program going. <laughs> Alan Cohen hadn't showed up with her yet. And they just did it. And uh, But... Were they, you know, with sinners like that, the, the perfect masters are actively drawn to such people because they're the ones who they can really help. Um, because they, they're a, I mean, what does a bonfire want? It wants fuel, right? So their bonfire wants all these sense scares of people. So I, I mean, I think that's worth keeping in mind. You know, if the time comes to have contact with Baba or with the perfect master, and you're feeling like uh, you're not worthy of it, <laughs> man. Those are the, it, 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 the perfect masters for you. They want such people. There's no need to be ashamed at all. That's what they're for: burning, consuming. And uh, let's see. That story where Baba said, "Why do you bring all this stuff to me?" What I really want is your imperfections. Yeah, yeah. The one thing I don't have is your imperfections. Yeah, Baba, I remember Eric saying that Baba was saying, people were giving him all these garlands and coconuts, and Baba was saying, why doesn't anybody give me what I want? Is that the one you're thinking of? And uh, so there's a big silence. And again, Baba said, why doesn't anybody give me what I want? Eric just telling us, and finally somebody in the Sahaba said, but Baba, what do you want? Why doesn't anybody give me what I want? And again, the book, but Baba, why won't you tell us what you want? He said, what I want is your imperfections. I have everything else, but this is what you have to give to me. Yeah. So here's a little more on this uh, renunciation. Why did Buddha renounce everything? In order to attain what is real. Why did Ramakrishna renounce everything in order to see and become one with God? Why did Tukaram renounce everything? He became, this as I mentioned, Tukaram is a uh, spectacularly world-class bad businessman. Uh, he became disgusted with the world because of continual losses and failures in business. Having renounced the world, there was created in him the love of God. After this, he had to pass through further untold sufferings. And he says, true renunciation is actual death. And uh, he, then Baba gives a real curious um, analogy. I've never seen anything quite like this. Oh, I want to read this. This is a Khaled um, quotation. And I just went to Delhi. I don't know if you know the Urdu poet Khaled. He was um, 19th century, often regarded as the greatest Urdu writer of um, uh, guzzles. And uh, this was right on his grave, which couple it turns out. This continual doing and being drowns everything in the sea of illusion. But to do nothing and to be nothing, this means truth. Indeed, this is the truth. I can't, let me try this. Nata kuch tu kudata, kuch nahota tu kudakota. Dubai, does anybody know Urdu? Can you do better than me? Um, Dubaiya mujko hone me nahota mai kachahota. It's a very famous couplet. When I was not, when this being of mine was not, 
I was God. When I was nothing, I was God. But this being, my own self-being, of being egotism, drowned me. Oh, had there not been this accursed I, in what unlimited infinite ocean of bliss, Anand, would I have been? This is a very infernal translation that Baba must have given um, for this. Um. And then there are a lot of these um, questions will come up. And this probably uh, uh, is by the Mandalay who will be raising these things. And I personally suspect that a lot of them are asked by wisdom, who would often ask these questions um, about, well, how are we to know this? Uh, we do, but how are we to disbelieve all the, these hard facts that come into our experience? How are we to feel and know that these things that we actually feel, see and feel are really nothing? Right, Baba had been holding them, all this that you see is bas, it's an illusion, it doesn't exist. So if, if this is Rustam, he's saying, well, how are we to know about this? Answer, uh, when we will know and understand with certainty that all this is nothing, you ask, we will know and realize that all this is nothing when we attain to that state. You have to have the experience before you can know it. And here he talks about the sound sleep state. But then at the very end of this, let's see. Uh, it gives a very um, unusual um, analogy. I've never seen anything quite like this before. Let's take another concrete figure to illustrate how the ordinary human awake state and the being and doing of the mind are brought to an end. Okay, how do you stop the mind? I'm just giving an analogy for that. Imagine a machine at work. It runs continuously. Now, if you approach the machine and cry aloud from a distance, stop operating, please. Of what use is this continual whirling and revolving of yours? <laughs> Do you expect the machine to desist from its operation simply because of your words and loud cries? Certainly not. Then what is required for your purpose? You need someone so bold and courageous as to grab hold of the machine as it is running and by sheer strength to force it to stop and to operate no more. For the machine on its own will never stop. This is our mind, right? Ain't it the truth? God, this bugger of a mind will not shut up no matter what I do. So, um... Uh, until such a one who is so, until such a one arrives who is daring enough to venture to manhandle it. Now, imagine further that this machine has a big wheel and many sharp points. Danta, can you imagine it's whirling and these blades are all over the place? Okay. One could not seize hold of such a device even when it is at rest and stationary. To grab hold of this deadly and dangerous mechanism when it is in motion would be to risk one's life in vain, since stopping it is next to impossible by any ordinary means. So then, what would an expert do to stop such a machine? First of all, he would take up some suitable instrument and standing at a distance, use it to break off the sharp spikes. You can imagine this. All these spikes are getting knocked off. Only when this had been accomplished would he venture to use his strength directly to stop the wheel from evolving, not otherwise. And um, actually, this is another one of these passages that tormented me for 15 years because uh, in the version of it I had, the reading was... The machine represents the wheel, and it's all blank. The wheel represents, the points represent the instruments. The, the key was missing in the manuscript that I had. But then in Phyllis Frederick's version, the words were filled in. So the machine represents the life of ordinary mankind, Manusha. The wheel represents birth and rebirth in the body. The points, those sharp points on the end of the uh, arms of this machine represent some The instruments 
represent good actions proceeding from infinite power and knowledge. Anant Shakti and Gyan and the expert stopper represents God realized Sun Guru. So there's a unusual figure metaphor um, uh, for the Sadhguru. Well, what is what? The machine represents the life of ordinary mankind. Manushya. That's mankind. And no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah, Phyllis uh, left her papers with the Pearsons, and about uh, four years ago, we suddenly found the copy of the manuscript where the blanks were filled in. <laughs> where did she get that from? She wasn't there in 27. Uh, yeah, um, Adi sent it to her. Baba told Adi to send to Phyllis second copies um, of papers that he had, so... We had been working on Tiffin lectures from 1997 until 2013, <laughs> and the manuscript that we had was had all these gaps all over everywhere. The figures were missing, the Gujarati words were missing, and everything. And uh, it just came to light suddenly. It was a complete surprise. It was a shock. I never would have believed that I had to go to California to get this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so let's see. Now, Baba also um, gives a... There's a whole psychology in Baba's um, early teachings that he didn't give again later. Um, and this diagram uh, shows the kind of model he was using. We, in uh, Nirana... Uh, in this past study program and in past years, we've studied this a lot more. But Baba gave a whole model of the false self that is very related to Indian psychology, actually, a traditional Indian psychology of Vedanta and um, Yoga, Patanjali Yoga, Sam Samkhya, some of the great schools of it. And the, the basic way that the false self is represented uh, here is as uh, a series of concentric koshas or layers or sheets or rings. And uh, you will see this in uh, um, a number of the... If you ever study Vedanta, you'll see this. But the innermost circle is the self, the Atman. And then there will be a series of uh, layers. And the outermost is the gross body. So Baba gave this a lot in his early years. And in fact, in his um, uh, a discourse, a uh, booklet published in 1943 called The Divine Theme, uh, you see the most developed form of this. That was reproduced in the supplement to God Speaks. So I'm just alerting you to it. Anyone interested in psychology, Mir Baba and psychology, this is a big aspect of his teachings in that respect. And you get a lot of it in this early stuff. So here you see um, the truth is at the center, and the truth means God, or the Atma, which is the self, with a capital S. And around that, the next layer is egotism, and the next layer around that is the intellect, or the buddhi, and around that is the mind, or manas, and what Baba seems to mean by mind or manas is, um, uh, it's not just Baba, but in Indian uh, uh, psychology, to use it, it's that aspect of the mind that uh, receives input and data from the senses, sight, hearing, smell, and so forth, and um, uh, processes it and formulates it into concepts, and it's sort of the hall of mirrors, the a lot of these processes of the mind of dealing with sensory input and relating it to concepts in your mind. Manas is that 
level of the mind, if that makes uh, sense to you guys. And around that is the subtle body, the sukshma sharir, and outside of that is the gross body. So we have a couple of these Tiffin lectures that will talk about that. And he explained, let's see, uh, he's talking here about different kinds of samadhi, and he explains a bit what they are, um, making reference to this. You know the word samadhi, right? Yoga samadhi. Have any of you ever done, like, uh, Raj Yoga or anything like that? Uh huh. Yes. Until Phyllis knocked you down. Yeah, yeah. Right. Kundalini yoga, anyone ever do that? that? It's a bit dangerous, Kundalini yoga. Anyway, in Raj Yoga Samadhi, one experiences the stopped mind state that has not yet gone beyond the intellect, as one does in the state of realization. In fact, what he says later in this lecture, as we'll see, in, um, uh, when you go into Raj Yoga Samadhi, um, your mind, the manas, is stopped. But your intellect and your egoism have not been. Uh, thus, um, there's a story that he gives in the discourses uh, illustrating this, where Baba talks about a uh, yogi in Gwalior. You guys remember this one? And he visited the town of Gwalior, and uh, there was a Raj there, and just before entering into samadhi, uh, the yogi uh, said to himself, um, the Raj should give me a hundred rupees or whatever it is. Uh, a nice sum of money in those days. And went into samadhi state. He actually did go into the samadhi state and remained in that state for several weeks. While he was there, word of this great yogi reached the ears of the Raj. And, of course, he wanted to find out who was this illustrious saintly being who had come into his town. And he went to visit him and disturbed him and uh, shook him out of his samadhi state. And the first thing the yogi said was, uh, give me a hundred rupees. <laughs> because the, the egotism and the intellect were still there in full force. The, you know, the desire nature was still fully operative. It's just his mind had been suspended for a period of time. So Baba did talk to a number of yogis uh, in, in the Chitta lectures, and he told them that samadhi is kind of like taking a vacation on the spiritual path. So it's like, uh, you know, you're working here in L.A., and unless you're pleasantly happily, serenely retired people like John Page, where you don't work anymore. Um, but if you're actually working, you work hard, and then you earn some money, and then you go on a holiday, right? But the holiday does not solve the problem, because once the holiday is over, you have to go back to work. Well, that's what samadhi is basically like um, on the spiritual path for yogis. You sort of earn credit from... Uh, your austerities and your yoga and all your abnegation, and you have you bliss out for a while, and once you've spent it off, you're back again. So it really doesn't help the situation at all. So um, Baba explained this to a bunch of the yogis who showed up, and now he gives. Let's see where this is. Yeah. Okay, the subtle state of the mind is of two types. One higher, let me see. In Raj Yoga Samadhi, Baba is actually making reference to what is depicted in this chart. And let's see if I can explain it. Um, Baba explained things that in a certain way in those days. He said that uh, when you go to sleep, you actually... Uh, experience the subtle sphere. Later on, he refined that saying the astral, so I won't worry about that, but you experience the subtle sphere in the semi-conscious state. The difference between those of us who are gross conscious and uh, people on the planes is that on the planes, you experience that um, subtle sphere in dream state while you're wide awake. So the uh, 
experience of the planes of consciousness, Baba said, is wakeful dreaming. And uh, God realization is wakeful sound sleep. So these three states of ours are actually deeply significant. So if you want God realization, all you need to do is when you go to sleep tonight, remain wide awake while going into sound sleep. If you can just get those two together, you're God realized. That's actually all that's all that's needed is to be well, wide awake while sound sleep. And when you're on the planes of consciousness, you're wakefully dreaming. So the wakeful state of the yogi is uh, he is experiencing um, the dream, the subtle sphere in the dream state while wide awake. While as the dream state of the ordinary human, we're experiencing the subtle sphere in the dream state. So Baba explains all of this topic here and in other places. Do you follow this? In Nirvana, we went over this. Uh, these three states are actually very central to Mirabada's um, teaching, it turns out. His darshana, as we're calling it. So in Raj Yoga Samadhi, which belongs to the higher state, Intellect and egoism persist, but the mind stops. When egoism comes down from this higher samadhi state, it begins to work again, and immediately the mind follows suit and becomes active also. So all that happens is your mind stops, but as soon as you're, you come out of it, everything else is unchanged and not improved at all. It doesn't actually deal with egoism or intellect. Now, what is this Nirvakalp Samadhi state of realization to which only states, saints or heroes, sants or viralas, can attain? But before one wins to that state, intellect and egoism have to be drowned in truth, and their places taken by jnana, knowledge. Mind and the subtle body remain, but egoism is gone forever. For when intellect and egoism have been annihilated, then alone can Nirvapalp Samadhi come. But this state cannot be attained without the grace of a guru. So, um, in terms of this earlier chart, in the case of a uh, majub, you know what a majub is? Uh, hmm? Yes, a God-realized soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're completely unconscious of the universe. They're completely oblivious to the universe. But here, Baba gives a new refinement on this. I mean, I mean, I'd always often wonder, well, if they're completely unconscious of the universe, why do they appear to be responsive? Like, um, sometimes if you bother them much, you might, you know, slap you or... If you sing, there was one must, if you would sing to him, I think he would eat or something like that. Um, so why are they responsive to the world at all? So, at all? And Baba explains a bit of that here. Actually, with a majub, this is a God-realized being, their intellect, buddhi, and their egoism are annihilated. They're gone forever. The perfect master in the, ad the avatar still have uh, an infinite divine ego, as a matter of fact. You can see that in some of these. You don't have any of the charts here, but in some, the Ten States of God chart, check it out and you'll see that circle is there for them. But it's gone for the majub and the intellect. But they still have manas. They still have a mind. And what Baba seems to explain here, let's see, in fact, let's go back to it. Uh, the Majub. And this was before Baba had done his work with the musts. So the Mandali didn't really know what musts were. Mm -hmm. That was a later phase of his work. Now look at the curious fun connected with the state of Nirvakalp Samadhi. Take the case of the Majub. As he is indeed Majub, that is, realized, his intellect and egoism, buddhi and ahankar, as explained above, are gone drowned in the truth. Still, his mind and subtle body remain. And although in another sense he is quit of these, which is to say, 
unconscious of them, impressions do automatically fall on his mind. These are impressions of the planes, and they are few, but the Majub is quite unaware of them, for when the givers of knowledge, the powers and elements of intellect and egoism, have disappeared from the scene, how can knowledge come into being? Nonetheless, mind and subtle and gross bodies abruptly begin to work, and this activity of theirs creates impressions. Do you get this? The impressions fall into his mind, and it starts the subtle and gross body operative. And those create impressions within the mind of the Maju, even though he's not conscious of them. Um, and it is only from these that the Maju begins the glimpse, that is, knowledge, of his own material existence. But these impressions disappear as quickly as they are formed, and the moment they are gone, he is once again unconscious in Majubiyat, quite absorbed in the ecstasy of eternal bliss. This is why Majub appear to be insane, if not Ganda, to worldly eyes. For what is the state of a carriage whose horses run ahead here and there without the guidance of a driver? In this analogy, the carriage refers to the Majub himself, while the horses represent the gross and subtle impressions of the mind, and the driver is the intellect and egoism, so there's no driver. It's like a carriage galloping ahead uh, without anybody <laughs> running it. What time are we at? We just probably just so you get the idea that the Majub is, is completely unconscious of the universe, but has a manas, a mind, and influences from the outside um, disturb the mind, and impressions get created, and the subtle and gross body acts. And he doesn't say it here, but he does later. Satchitanand itself, Satchitanand is existence, consciousness, bliss, directly act on those impressions. And they're immediately spent and annihilated. And this causes the Majub to appear to act. But the instant that, and there, it seems like there's even, the Majub gains the glimpse. It seems like the Majub has a flickering glimpse of experience of the world. That's what it sounds like to me, anyway. Um, through the medium of these impressions that have been created. But the moment that happens, they're annihilated. And the Majub is out of it again. We read yesterday about uh, Balul's marriage, right? You remember that? This is, this is a Majub Sali. So... Uh, that's what happens if you get married to a Majub Sali. If you get married to a Majub, it's, uh, um, don't expect um, a lot of attention. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and let's see what else is said here. Yeah. So uh, maybe that's enough on that. So in a sense, a Majub is the opposite of a, a Raj Yogi, because for the Raj Yogi, the Manas has been temporarily suspended or annihilated for the time being in the, the Samadhi state. But the egoism and the intellect are still there in full force. But in the case of the Majub, the intellect and the egoism are annihilated forever, but the Manas is still there. And so reaction comes out of that. So anyway, I'm, get, I'm going over this as a little bit of, uh, for people with interest in psychology, here's a little bit of uh, Baba's Indian-based psychological account of some of these spiritual types of personalities. And you'll see other uh, think parts about this, sections on this elsewhere. Now, let's see, what will be some other things to look at. Baba did give his men a little bit of a taste of um, meditation. He didn't do it very often. Yeah. So, 
Baba was, uh, had announced that Maravada was going to be dissolved and he was going to leave. As I mentioned yesterday, what wound up happening um, was that uh, they went to, not to Persia, as Baba had said they would, but they went to Lenavala, which is in the Ghats, the mountains between Pune and Bombay. If you've gone to Nagar, you go through Lenavala um, each time you drive through it. And uh, it's a nice hill station, and they had a sort of a holiday. And then Baba went down to Bombay and was there for three weeks. And then he suddenly came back to Maribad, to everybody's surprise, and started up the whole ashram again. This is after the humiliation of closing the thing down, you know, and having everyone, uh, you know, criticize him for that. So having shut it down, he started up again. Um, but so this is just when they were about to leave for that. So almost on the eve of their departure from Maribad, in a rare session with the Mandali, Baba gave his men the taste of subtle experience through the glimpse and echo of subtle sight and hearing. And this is what he did. All were instructed to close their eyes for a short time. After three or four minutes had passed, they were ordered to open their eyes again. Asked what they had experienced, some said that they had at first seen only darkness, but then out of that darkness, small circles of light appeared, and in the end, only one circle remained. Thereupon, Sri explained, All of you closed your eyes. Now, when your eyes were closed, who was it that actually saw these circles of light and the rest of it, as you have just related? It was your mind that saw all of this through your subtle eye. You know, we have a subtle eye. We have subtle senses, subtle hearing, subtle nose, actually. I think those are the three senses you have on the subtle things. Even though your gross eye was closed, that is, even though you were looking into darkness, now, seeing this seeing of circles constitutes a step on the path towards seeing the Almighty, who is eternal light. At first, you see circles, then colors, then skies, that's the English word for asmans, uh, inner worlds, until at last you see the very fountain of light, light truth itself, the winning of which is the aim, object, and intention of everyone. If you could see all these things, the circles, colors, skies, and so forth, with your eyes open, then you could be said to have developed the powers of your subtle eye. Many of you, and many others in the world, must have closed your eyes from time to time with the intention of seeing something. But has this explanation, as I have just given it, ever occurred to you or anyone else? None of the uh, really experienced ones has ever explained this to you in such clear terms, etc. I'm going to jump. In just the same way, Sri proceeded to give his mandali experience of inner hearing together with an explanation. First, he ordered all of them tightly to seal off their ears for three or four minutes. And then he asked each one what had been his experience. They replied that at first silence prevailed, but subsequently they heard, a, heard distant sounds as of rolling thunderclouds or a moving train. After that, they heard sounds far off like train whistles. Have any of you ever done this? Had this experience? Again, Sri explained, since your ears were tightly sealed off from outer sound, who heard these things? Again, it was this same mind that heard through your subtle ear. These sounds were the sixth shadow of the real and original sound. If you were to proceed and progress toward onwards, developing this newly hearing faculty of yours further, you would begin to hear pleasing musical notes, nods, as are heard on the planes of consciousness. So, um, 
So this was a little taste that Baba seems to have given his mandali of um, meditation that would lead towards the you know experience of subtle things. I remember one time Eric um, saying that he was. Do you remember this, John? He was among the mandali uh, when Baba had them do this too. I remember he, Baba had them do a little bit of meditation. I remember Eric saying it was just starting to become enjoyable, and Baba stopped it. So here's one of the rare cases where Baba had his men do it's a little bit of meditation, just a, a sample of a taste, a taste of it. And uh, the next day, just about, Baba had with him at that time a seeker of God. Gopal Swami was his name. And most of the people who came to Baba's seekers of God were uh, um, not sincere. I remember there was one seeker of God during this period who uh, came to Baba um, saying that he had had a dream uh, that um, he should go to the great uh, Sadhguru of Mirabad and uh, the Sadhguru would give him 50 rupees. And Baba said, oh, this is so. Well, I too had a dream. I had, God told me that a, a rascal would show up asking me for 50 rupees and that I should beat him and throw him out of the place. <laughs> so having exposed the guy for the fraud he was, Baba actually gave him the money. As a matter of fact. But, so there are lots of people like that. But Gopal Swami was a real one, and he stayed with Baba throughout that entire year. Then he wound up leaving, but Baba was very happy with him. Actually, right next to Mirabad, the Samadhi, which now the Samadhi, uh, they constructed then what's called the Sadak Ashram. Um, I don't know if it was still there in 1969. I was asking yesterday, does anybody know? These little cabins right next to the Samadhi, if you're facing the door of the Samadhi on the right-hand side, there are these seclusion cabins. And uh, during 1927, when Baba was giving these talks to the Mir Ashram boys, including Svendir Vasali, of course, um, there were uh, several men who were in seclusion in those cabins over this period, and Gopal Swami was one of them. So, uh, he was, he was the real McCoy. So Gopal Swami was a sincere seeker of God who came to stay at Mirabad in January 1926 and remained with Baba on and off until February 1928. Of all the sannyasis, sadhus, fakirs, and others of this type who had approached Baba until this time, Gopal Swami was, according to Baba, the most sincere. In August of 1926, Baba told him that he would achieve mukti, liberation, in that very lifetime. So this is a, a great soul, obviously. Later, at the very start of Baba's second long stay at Mirabad, Gopal Swami was selected as one of the five men to sit in seclusion in one of the cells in the Sadak Ashram on Mirabad Hill during the critical period of December 1927 through January 1928 that led to the creation of the Prem Ashram. By the way, this is the uh, Sai Darbar, one of the, one of the buildings I was telling you about yesterday. Baba read at the door of it here. Meanwhile, in November 1926, on the very eve of Baba's departure for Lanabla and the ostensible closing down of the Maribad Ashram, Gopal Swami had an extraordinary vision as is related in this Tiffin lecture. And here's how it's described. Oops. It so happened that Gopal Swami reported having had Sakshatkar Dashan. Sakshatkar is one of the words Baba used at this time, and it means immediate presence. So the Satchatkar Darshan would be the immediate presence of the uh, one with whom um, this Darshan one was having. Having had Satchatkar Darshan of Sri last night, 
in a state of full wakefulness. Having stayed awake through most of the night, all of a sudden he saw an assembly of devtas, gods, in the heavens. All of them stood up to honor the arrival of some high divine official who turned out to be Sri. To behold in full wakefulness one's guru in such heavenly assembly, surrounded by gods and other such beings, this is called Sakshatkar Darshan, and it can be obtained only after much preparedness and deserving. Sri thereupon spoke about the Swami in terms of praise and promised that he would make him a sant, a, a saint of the fifth or sixth plane. Uh, the Swami had been found to be very sincere, silent, and obedient. His comportment had given nothing at all to complain of. His vision of his guru in the heavenly assembly on the very eve of Baba's departure from Maribad indicated his love and faith in Sri, who was sure to bestow his grace on such a severe, uh, such a sincere devotee as he. But then it turns out there is a higher kind of mystical experience. The topic then turning to Sakar Darshan. Sakar means with form. Sri, in the course of his explanation, informed the Mandali about an American, one of the circle, but not among the chief members, who saw him every day in this way. This person saw Sri in his usual pose and dress, and this he could do whenever he liked. So I've always wondered who this was. Baba hadn't been to America yet, but I would imagine he might have encountered this person, or maybe not, maybe the person remained hidden. So somebody could see Baba um, as he appeared to the Mandali whenever he wanted to from America. To see a guru in his assumed form, such as that in which Sri appears at present, is called Sakha Darshan, as compared with Sakshatkar Darshan, in which one hold, beholds the guru in his original form. So, to see Baba in this glorious, splendorous form up in amid all the gods is actually less high than it is to be able just to see him in his ordinary human form from, uh, uh, from America or from other parts of the world. Sakha Darshan is higher than Sakshatkar Darshan. The same appearance of the Guru in his assumed form when it occurs in a dream is called Dhrishtant, etc. So, 